नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Today we are reading from Canto 10 of Shrimad Bhagavatam chapter 3 entitled The Birth of Lord Krishna text 11 I am sincerely grateful and and extraordinarily happy to be back with all of you again. Thank you. In this verse of Shrimad Bhagavatam Vasudeva and Devaki at midnight shackled with chains in a prison are seeing the beautiful form of the Lord who appeared as their son. Also Dave was a great prince with enormous wealth beauty knowledge yet he and along with his wife Devaki who was a transcendental divine personality in every way were apparently condemned to live in a prison for many many years at least 7 or 8 years and what did they do wrong Basu Dev was marrying Devaki with the blessings of the brahmans with the blessing of the gurus with the blessings of all the great rishis their parents everyone and according to tradition he was simply taking her to his home and this kamsa being the cousin brother of Devaki He wanted to give his sister a feeling of confidence by personally driving her home. As Srila Prabhupada explains, when a young lady is, according to the traditional Vedic standard of how marriages were performed a young lady lives with her parents and her friends and after she marries she moves to a whole new house another village so to help to minimize the feelings of separation many friends are sent with her and kamsa wanted to drive her himself and you all know the story how that voice came from the sky and said that you're the eighth child of devaki will be the cause of your death now vasudev didn't tell that voice to speak what was his fault kamsa was so attached to his own life that he was about to kill his own sister who perhaps more than anywhere any other person in the world 
he really had affection for. But he was willing to gruesomely sever her head with his sword on her marriage day in front of everyone. How shameless. And he was going to do it. It wasn't just a threat. And Vasudev started speaking very nice philosophy to Kamsa. If you're actually concerned with your own well-being, then don't you know that by committing this heinous deed, you are going to suffer miserably? Because the soul is eternal. Real culture, real knowledge is to understand that this body is a temporary situation and everything related to the body is a temporary situation. And the soul, according to its destiny, is forced to go from one body to another to another. Just like a traveler. When traveler walks, it lifts up one foot to put down another. But in order to make progress, your rear, as your front foot goes, hits the ground, your rear foot comes off the ground. And it has to leave behind wherever it was standing. So in the same way, the bodies are always changing, but the soul is forever. So real understanding, real knowledge, is to do what's best for the eternal soul. So if you commit this wicked deed of killing your own sister, you are going to have to suffer miserably. She's innocent. So don't do it, Kamsa, for your own sake, for the sake of Dharma, for the sake of your family. But when a person is infatuated by material obsession, oftentimes just can't can't hear. You could listen, but you can't hear. Just doesn't touch the heart. Distraction. Obsession is such a distraction. What was his obsession? For power. For all the things. The more he acquired, the more attached he was to his ego. So Vasudev, as an emergency measure, he had to somehow or other reach Kamsa's heart. Actually, this is what preaching is about. You have to reach somebody's heart, otherwise they don't change. And sometimes our preaching is planting seeds, but in this case, this, his need to reach Kamsa's heart was really an emergency. If he didn't reach him right then and there, his wife would have been slaughtered. Her head would have been rolling off the chariot onto the ground. Blood would have been gushing and covering everybody. Obviously. So somehow, he had to be effective in his preaching. He spoke philosophy. Philosophy is great, provide people hear it. <laughs> Otherwise, it really has no value if you're just speaking for the sake of yourself. Vasudev could have gone down in history that I spoke the right philosophy. My wife's dead. Kams is going to hell. Krishna is not going to be born according to his arrangement. But I spoke the philosophy. <laughs> and I didn't change anything. Of course, he didn't change anything. But he had to do what worked. He had to do what worked to serve the mission of Krishna. And therefore, he just came down to a really, really, the human level that Kamsa was on in order for Krishna to appear and deliver the world. He said, Kamsa, 
Your sister's not the threat. Her children are the threat. I vow to you on this day, I will give you every one of her children and you can do anything you want with the child, but leave Devaki alone. This was what worked. Kamsa knew that whatever Devaki, whatever Vasudev speaks, he will never go back on his word of honor. This was his integrity. This was his character. Now this was an incredible thing. Kamsa trusted Vasudev that much. If Vasudev didn't do what he was saying he was going to do, Kamsa knew that he would be killed by one of the children of David. He was willing, Kamsa was willing to put his life on the line due to his trust in the character of Vasudev. Vasudev was really a good preacher. And we have to understand what gave his preaching the power to protect Krishna, to assist Krishna in his mission in this way, was his character. Because what he said wouldn't have worked unless Kamsa had faith in him. Now, when any of us are trying to give people Krishna, in one sense, we're trying to get them to give up their Kamsa-like propensities. Attachment to the ego, to lust, to envy, to greed, to pride, to anger. We're telling people, basically, when we're giving them Krishna consciousness, give all these things up. Give up your attachment and your obsessions to all the things that you are so much addicted to in this world. So that Krishna can appear within your heart. So in one sense, whether we're distributing books, whether we're speaking to people, we are in the role of Vasudev speaking to Kamsa. <laughs> now they may be nice Kamsas. <laughs> they may be pious Kamsas. <laughs> but the reality is the same obsession, maybe in a very different, there's the mode of goodness, passion, and ignorance. Kamsa was really in the modes of ignorance and passion to an extreme. But still, in order to get people to really hear, people have to trust us. People have to see that our character is worthy of listening to us and worthy of receiving that knowledge and worthy of actually making a change. So why Srila Prabhupada said philosophy without good character is practically useless. It's practically useless from the one who's speaking it and, for the, and, and to try to give it to somebody else. So Kamsa said yes. And I guess he took them to their house. And then everything was kind of going on like usual. No problem. Now, if we were not such surrendered souls as Vasudev and Devaki, we probably would have secretly went to some other kingdom and then had a baby. Or else, you know, Vasudev and Devaki were not attached to anything. They could have just become Brahmatrini and Brahmachari living at home. 
Yes, what to, you know, they could have become brahmachari grihastas and not have babies. Some people do like that. It's a distraction. Now, this is really a distraction. Some people think not having babies, you know, you're freed from the distraction of the crying and, and all the stools and urines and all that stuff. <laughs> but this distraction means you're going to be, the baby's going to be killed. So they had a baby. And incredibly, Vasudev brought this baby right to Kamsa and said, here, I promised you. Now, even though Vas Kamsa knew he would do it, still he was astonished. You're giving me your firstborn male son, knowing that I'm going to kill it? And you came here and gave it to me? You could have hid it. You know, in the Bible, what was it? When Moses was born, they put him in a little basket and threw him, just floated him down the Nile River so he wouldn't be killed. But he gave the baby to Kamsa. Kamsa said, you are just such a pious and honest person. Take this child back and I'll... Just the eighth child, bring that one. <laughs> but Vasudev knew that this was not going to last because Kamsa was too much attached to his ego. We cannot trust somebody who has too deep material attachments. Real trust is when somebody you know, under any situation, they're going to have integrity. And then, inconceivably, according to Krishna's divine arrangement, Narada Muni happens to visit Kamsa. Yes? Narada Muni knows exactly what's Krishna's will. And Krishna's will has so many layers and so many dimensions and so many perspectives and from so many different angles of vision. He's trying to accomplish so many different purposes all at the same time. And Krishna has an infinite intelligence. He has infinite knowledge of everything and everyone. He knows past, present, and future. And besides all that, he's infinitely merciful, and he has an infinite sense of humor. <laughs> and a lot of times he manifests all of these different qualities through a devotee like Narada. And yet, you know, little you and me, we want to think, I know what Krishna wants. You know, we have, from one little tiny, from our perspective, you know, sitting in a little room in Bombay. <laughs> yes, absolute, I know what Krishna wants. Okay. Krishna's listening to you from within your heart. So what happens now is Narada Muni comes in the house and he says to Kamsa, well, first Kamsa, because he knows he's going to get some pious deeds that's going to protect his material attachments and obsession for power. Kamsa has already imprisoned Ugrasena, his own father, so that he can assume the entire kingdom for himself. What kind of a nonsense person? But this tendency is in all of us. We see to what degree the human ego can be degraded if we just are inattentive and let it go that way. 
It happens all the time, even within the world around us today. The only difference is people just aren't as powerful as Kamsa. He imprisons his own father. Meanwhile, Narada Muni tells him after Kamsa greets Narada Muni and gives him honor and respect, thinking that that's what will help him to maintain his power and prestige. And actually, if you read Hiranyakashipu's prayers to Lord Brahma, and if you see Narada's respect, I mean, Kamsa's respect to Narada, you see how people who are really, really selfish and demoniac can be extraordinary religious in the sense of, you know, doing the right pujas and the right mudras and the, 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 the right prayers and the right respect, but they have the wrong motives. So after Kamsa offers honors to Narada, Narada gives him a little philosophy. And then he says, according to Hari Vamsa, Prabhupada quotes it, he says, actually Kamsa, I was just traveling around the universe. <laughs> and I just wanna, just wanna inform you of what I heard, that the devas, your Enemies are going to be taking birth in the Yadu and the Vrishni dynasty and the Supreme Lord is coming. They could come as any of these children in this dynasty. It's Krishna's coming. He could come any time. Your enemies could be any of these children. And by the way, in your past life, your name was Kalanemi and Vishnu killed you and he's coming back to kill you again. So, <laughs> and played his vena and left. He knew exactly how Kamsa would respond to that. He immediately called his guards. They dragged Devaki and Vasudev, threw them in a prison, shackled them in iron chains, and kept them as prisoners. And every time Devaki and Vasudev had gave birth to a child, Kamsa would come down and slaughter it, right in front of Vasudev and Devaki, mercilessly. He would sometimes just take the little infant, little baby, by the tender little feet, and dash him against a stone again and again and again until the baby was just. I don't want to give an improper example. But it was just crushed and bloodied. Vasudev and Devaki loved their children. Six children. Of course, Narada knew that these were six great sages, the sons of Marichi who actually really wanted to die so that they could go back to their, to their abode because they were cursed to take this death. They were cursed to become born in this world. Anyways, the seventh child we know is Ananta who was transferred from the womb of Devaki to the womb of Rohini and he was born as Balaramji in Gokul. And then Dev, Dev, Devaki became pregnant with Krishna. How did it happen? Krishna appeared within the heart of Vasudev. And just like the sun casts its light on the rising moon, from the heart of Vasudev, Krishna transferred himself by his own sweet will to the heart of Devaki. And when she became pregnant with Krishna, she became so beautiful, so effulgent, 
Kamsa knew this is the child, the eighth son. And he had his guards surrounding that prison cell with the order, the moment that this child is born, tell me. And he was just in excruciating anguish and anxiety. Very interesting. He had everything he wanted except happiness. He had the biggest, most powerful armies in the planet. He had the greatest wealth of anyone in the planet. He had the greatest power and prestige as anyone in the planet. Anything he said, people would do out of fear. He had no opposition. He had made alliances with Jarasandha and other such powerful kings. They had everything. But he, there was no happiness. He was always in anxiety. He was always fearing death. 24 hours a day, he could hardly sleep at night because he was just horrified by the idea of death. That all that he had gained would be taken away. And Vasudev and Devaki, they're down there in this prison cell, just living their lives. They can't go on any vacations. They were in one room the whole time, with chains, for about eight years at least. And the demigods were coming and offering prayers to the Lord. And on this most auspicious moment of midnight, Krishna. Devaki didn't have any labor pains. Of course, eight years in prison is a lot more worse than a labor pain. <laughs> but, but to speak of seeing six of her children butchered before her eyes, But then Krishna just came out from her womb and manifest himself in the air in his form of Vishnu with four arms, with a golden crown, the Kastubamani, the most precious of all jewels around his neck gold and rubies and sapphires and chintamani gems on his, on his um, the bracelets around his arms and his wrists and his ankles and a magnificent dhoti that was golden like the bright as the flashing of lightning. And he gazed down at Vasudev and Devaki with his forearms holding the conch shell and the, the Sudarsan chakra and the lotus flower, and the club. Not an ordinary baby. And Vasudeva and Devaki looked up and Vasudeva is totally struck with wonder. That's where we find us in this verse today. And Lord Krishna was smiling upon him. And Vasudev, here is my worshipable Lord. And he's come as my own son. <laughs> and how is it? He's a little baby dressed with such jewels and such silks in this prison. And what's most <coughs> emphasized in this particular verse is how Vasudev wanted to celebrate the birth of Krishna as his child. 
Now, what kind of celebration do you do when it's just you and your wife in a prison cell? They had shackles on their feet. They couldn't even dance. But when there's love and devotion, there cannot be any restriction. On the material level, there's always restrictions. But in bhakti, because bhakti is unlimited, there is no restrictions in how we, we are facilitated to offer our love to Krishna. We've seen many great personalities, even in their old age, when they can't walk and they can't move, but there's no reason, it's not an impediment to their devotional service. Srila Prabhupada was always reminding us of this. The only impediment for our devotional service is our own willingness to serve. Other than that, Krishna does not accept the thing. Krishna accepts, Prabhupada says, the intent, the purpose in which it is offered. That is what is all important. We read in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, when Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in Puri, Shivananda Sain would invite him for prasad. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was so obliged to Shivananda Sain because Shivananda Sain, he gave his heart, soul, life, everything to serve the devotees. He was totally selfless in his service. Every year, two to four hundred devotees would come all the way to Puri by foot, and he would arrange all the meals, all the accommodations, pay all the taxes. He arranged in such a way that he was the only one who suffered inconvenience, and everyone else just was happy. Any inconvenience that would have been to anyone, he took it upon himself so that they could just chant and dance all the way to Puri. But Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he prayed that the greatest happiness is the sufferings I endure to please you, my Lord. And taking that on a very deep level, Lord Chaitanya taught Das Das Anu Das, to take on suffering to serve devotees or even conditioned souls is the greatest happiness for a Vaishnav. There's a whole different perspective of what happiness is. And when we just catch this, then we can be happy. It's so easy. But it's not so easy. <laughs> You're laughing because it makes sense, I think. <laughs> as long as we're thinking that our happiness is what I can get, you can never be happy. Because Kamsa was getting everything, but he was never happy. But when we just change our whole perspective and understand my happiness is how I can give, how I could serve, how I could serve Krishna, how I could serve the Vaishnavas, how I could give Krishna to the people of the world. That's my happiness. And all that really is required is that we want to do that and we do what we can. Shivananda Sain, not only did he serve all the devotees, but we all know that famous story about the stray dog that happened to join his party. 
It wasn't a pedigree <laughs> poodle <laughs> that he got attached to for being so fluffy and cute and all that stuff. He was just a stray dog, an Indian dog. <laughs> In those days, they weren't importing these rare breeds to India like they do now. He was just a stray Indian dog. And he was just, he just, he just started walking with the devotees. And Shivananda Sen was, he was so much compassionate that I have to bring this dog to Lord Chaitanya. By any means, I have to bring, we're going, I have to bring this dog to Lord Chaitanya. This dog will be delivered if he just gets Lord Chaitanya's mercy. And he arranged special prasad, because the dog, I guess, didn't like what the devotees were eating, so he, <laughs> he had a special cook for the dog. <laughs> Can you imagine? What a detail, he's arranging all the accommodations, everything for all these 400 people going for weeks and weeks, and he has special arrangements for this dog. He's paying special tolls to get him across rivers on boats where no dogs are allowed. He was doing, going to great length without neglecting anyone. So Lord Chaitanya was so overwhelmed with Shivananda saying, he said, he said, mm, you, I am your own son. Your family is my family. And anytime Shivananda saying invited Lord Chaitanya for prasad, Lord Chaitanya would come. And anything Shivananda saying cooked, Lord Chaitanya ate. And he ate so much of what Shivananda Sain cooked. It was all prasad with ghee and spices. He overate. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's not possible for Krishna to overeat. But yet, if he wants to overeat, he does. <laughs> this is the inconceivable nature of Krishna. Krishna can eat all that thousands of tons of boga that Nanda Maharaj and all the Brahmins and all the Brijabhasis offered to Govardhan Hill, he just, within a moment, he ate it all. And he wanted more. And we already saw how Lord Chaitanya, you know, at another time he ate a whole room full of prasad within a few minutes. So he's unlimited. How could someone who's unlimited overeat and get indigestion in the process? But for the sake of loving reciprocation, he did. And the son of Shivananda Sain understood Lord Chaitanya's difficulty. So the next day he told Lord Chaitanya, he, he, he and the son of Shivananda Sain invited Lord Chaitanya and he just had some dahi with some medicinal spices mixed in it and some ginger and lemon <laughs> and really bitter digestive stuff. You know, black pepper and all that. And Lord Chaitanya was in ecstasy eating it. Now, none of the stuff tasted good, but because of the intention to please the Lord, the Lord, it was as good as the feast that Nanda Maharaj offered him at Govardhan. Some digestive aids. Because the Lord sees the content, and that's what he accepted. That's what gives him happiness. So Vasudev, he knew this completely. No restriction. Here he is, in prison, absolutely in poverty. He had nothing. Everything was taken away. But for the pleasure of Krishna, who is 
shining before him in the air, right before his eyes, Vasudev started offering in his mind millions and millions of cows to Brahmins. Each cow, we can understand, you know, had golden horns and silver hoods and, and jeweled necklaces and pearls and silks and all these things. He's just giving them away, give, 